Trident Wargaming. Build it, paint it, play it. Hey everybody, welcome back to Trident Wargaming. Uh, this is going to be the open mic on Hobby Night. We're actually going to be doing this episode from our weekly Sunday night paint night. We've got a whole gaggle of people in here uh, tonight. Say hey everybody. Hi everybody. Hey. 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 Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> a lot of people. So uh, just to uh, kick things off before hello. we get <laughs> Before we get rolling, <laughs> uh, we've, we're going to actually be making some changes to our Patreon. We want to give um, a couple different tiers as options. Uh, one of the things we're going to actually be having a members-only VIP uh, channel here on the Discord. That lets you jump on and talk with us about pretty much whatever you want. Uh, we can do some tactics talks or just overall lore or whatever. Um, we'll be expanding on that in a little bit. But uh, we just want to start offering different ways to engage with the community. Uh, we figured that's a really good place to start and probably start looking at doing like a YouTube live um, type thing in the future as well. Uh, again, just to promote that engagement and uh, get to chat with all of you people. Um, so before, uh, uh, before I hold up too much longer, just kick in. Uh, we're doing hobby stuff this whole this whole hour, this whole episode, we're going to be just chatting and lying and um, focusing on a couple of the the sad left out indexes for 40k and what can be done to make them better. We we want to focus on that a little bit due to the fact that you know uh, hobby talk, uh, not hobby talk, but like uh, <clears throat> game talk in 40k so very often revolves around you know, comp play, what's going on at all the big tournaments and what all the, you know, big YouTube stars are talking about and shit. And usually that's all like the really well-balanced and or overbalanced codexes. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about those who get left behind, <laughs> who obviously pop up a lot on Reddit, but uh, we don't really give them enough of the limelight, I don't think. Um, but I do think that before we get too far into things, a good thing to start off with would be just to introduce everybody who's actually here. Uh, because in addition to Bill and uh, Andy, whose hands you can see deftly handling some terrain right now, and uh, Arthur, whose birthday it is today, uh, well, whose, birthday, whose birthday it was a few days ago, I guess, by the time you're seeing this, uh, we do have at least uh, seven other fellows here <laughs> with us tonight, who actually, and we might have a few more drop in, we'll see how it goes. But why don't you guys introduce yourselves one after the other, feel free to muffle your voice and or offer a fake name, uh, if that suits you. <laughs> Starting with Jordan. Uh, hello, choose me. my name is Jordan. <laughs> my niche fetish is playing Imperial Knights and breaking people's dreams. So and I want wrong. you to hate this game as much as I hate myself. So you're wrong on most of the parts. Uh, it's Chaos Knights. That's why I already hate myself. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I'm Jordan. Uh, I've been playing, what, two years now? I play predominantly uh, Chaos Knights, and I'm working on Imperial Knights and Harlequins for my next two armies. Very nice. Uh, Jordan's kind of selling himself short because he has this really unique paint scheme for his knights in that... Uh, I mean, Jordan, why don't you explain it? And if you have a photo you could share... Um, yeah, I can go... Especially maybe like our work in progress Wednesday this week to be like, hey, as, as featured on the Hobby Podcast, uh, yeah. just tell people about that. Yeah, I can do that for sure. Um, so the... Theme I have for my Chaos Knights is the Hot Rods and Rat Rods of the Chaos Gods. So half of them are uh, Hot Rod themes, so uh, everything is candied uh, paint schemes with high amounts of chrome on them. And those two gods are the opposing Slanesh and Corn. Then the f uh, other ones are the Rat Rods, so they're a lot more dirtier, and those are my Zinch and Nurgle theme knights. And I've got one big knight, uh, which I lovingly call Heartless. I, I've done some free handing on. That's a blue and bones uh, scheme for it. And, I love uh, it. It's all for the Heartless Cup. 
we're racing today. Hmm. I'd actually awesome. have seen those, but I didn't know you had such a theme behind them. That's pretty cool. Yeah. The reason why it's also on a white base is because I'm going to paint it later. Mm -hmm. uh, the best, well, the most known place in uh, like for us for testing speeds for uh, hot rods and stuff is the is the Nevada Salt Flats. That's why all my bases are white. Nice, nice. That's a, that's a really nice idea, man. Right, we also have Cody here with us. Sorry, go ahead, Nick Jordan. Uh, I, I just need to now get a whole bunch of Hot Wheels and cut them in half and put them on the base. <laughs> some tr some track marks, perhaps. <coughs> uh, we also got Cody here with us tonight. I think he was telling us he just played his very first game of Tenth Edition today, right, Cody? Yeah, yeah, just uh, hammered it out. It was a it was a fun time, small point game, but uh, everything everything went aces for me, so. It was a lot of fun. You'd say you enjoyed it, though. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was. The rules are pretty straightforward. Um, we only had like one or two moments of like check the rule book. Um, That's but yeah, really good for a first game. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been I've been watching a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. that's fair. Did you find that there was a lot of like edition bleed where you're like, well, I think this does this, but that it actually didn't, and it was an old edition thing, or is oh, tenth edition yes. streamlined oh, yeah. as uh, uh, it, it is to be. It's it's a lot more streamlined, but I had a lot of uh, addition blade because I, I play Her heresy and I've played you know ninth edition and and it's like oh yeah this is how this works so I'd be like no I'm like oh, oh right <laughs> what uh, army are you working on right now Cody uh, I'm working on my Tyranids. I'm actually working on my screamer killer ooh sexy like yeah. the new one yeah 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 that's an awesome fucking model yeah I got my uh... I got my brain bug basically done today, so I just wanted to take a, a break from doing infinite amount of dots on its carapace because I'm doing this like this dotted, um, kind of like crab look on them. Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, you gray, then you do gray dots, and then you you wash it purple, and then I do white dots for all the kind of like highlighting, and it takes forever. <laughs> I think I've seen a few of your models like that, perhaps. Or maybe it wasn't you, but I, I remember seeing a Tyranid's army that had that kind of a theme uh, to it. It's not I it's not mine, because I've only got, like, three or four models done for it. I've got my, my Hive Tyrant and my Brain Bug. Well, it was somebody at uh, Red Claw, I remember. They had, it was kind of a, a blue and purple scheme. It looked, anyway, it looked really sharp, so you're on the right track. Yeah. No, the all the flesh on it is like pallid witch flesh highlighted with white, so it's oh, yeah, okay. it, it goes from really dark to really pale. Oh, cool. Yeah. Is there anybody else who's with us who cares to introduce themselves, or uh, the rest of you wish to remain anonymous? Just the voice. Uh, hi, I'm Isaac. I like long week, long walks on the beach. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, is, he has soft hands. <laughs> yeah, Bill, you're a little obsessed with my hands, and it's getting a little, a little creepy. <laughs> we all know what he's Bill, about. It's only weird if you make it weird. Bill's making it weird. Don't make it weird. Or do. Own it. But yeah, I'm working on my Votan right now. Which will be definitely a topic of conversation for this cast. <laughs> what is it about Votan? That uh, <laughs> threw you to playing them, Isaac. Originally, I know you bought into them because you saw how broken they are when that Codex book first drops. And everyone <laughs> talked about how it was going to be the most busted thing ever. You're like, that's the army for me. But like, what is it now that brings you to wanting to paint these space agents of the far future with Tau technology? Well, besides the question, everything in your statement was false. <laughs> <laughs> I made a little attacked or... Because I did not get into them because they're broken. I liked, uh, I actually like the models. Um, they have that kind of futuristic, somewhat modern military look and feel to them. Um, like the special of, forces vibe? Yeah, yeah, and kind of like that almost Eastern European military look, and especially to the vehicles. Um, yeah, like uh, brutalist. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they and then they also kind of have a like a slight, um, uh, you know, imperial mashed with, uh, 
you know, anime kind of feel and look to them as well. Um, I also really like just how, you know, how the armor looks on them and they're kind of like small and chunky and Space yeah. dwarves. No, they're kind of, they're, they're kind of industrial looking, honestly. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. They got that industrial. Yeah. And, and, you know, with the last couple of years with my painting style and look and feel, I've really been going more towards that grim, dark and beat up and weathered look. And I feel like the the dwarves of space really lend themselves to that, especially their vehicles. I, I really always, like their vehicles too. So. And I've always wanted to do my my two favorite colors are gray and orange. So I've always wanted to do that mashup. So I'm just taking advantage of it. I find I orange, like the, orange, and yellows make a really nice contrast on gray. I feel like like I like um, I like your color scheme, Isaac. But I do feel like. Saying my two favorite colors are oranges and gray is is a weird comment. What what draws you to to gray? <laughs> well, for me, gray is universal with everything. Gray works with a lot of different stuff, um, uh-huh. but tonally, you know, you can go really dark with it. You can go really bright with it, and it still works no matter what. Um, That's I find I find it also really works well for the grim dark aesthetic uh, because. You know, you look at anybody who does green dark style; it always, it always, it's always within a gray spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I wanted to have mine be a little bit brighter because my orange is. You know, I know Ryan's not here, but I know when Ryan did his Votan, his Votan are very bright, almost to that neon aspect of orange. Yeah. Um, mine are a little bit more. You know, not right. necessarily burnt, not necessessarily burnt umber, but a bright, a brighter orange. Yeah. Um, so the, the gray is going more to that kind of white spectrum, but uh, burnt, yeah, I, burnt umber. You yeah. have a candle in that, I think. Does it smell? Uh, does it smell fantastic? It smells. You know the, the Oilers themed dice tray you have with the club is now coming to full perspective. That orange. I don't see any gray, but like the orange. Uh, the, the 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 Oilers one is is the clubs. It's the clubs <laughs> dice tray. It's not my. <laughs> it's the, the clubs. That was a gift for the family. <laughs> the f- the familia, the family. But you know, well, I, I will... even Sorry, when I did my even when I did my towel, I, I try. You know, I liked using gray in there. I just um, I don't know. I'm just a fan of gray. I think even, all though, the, even though technically gray is not actually a color. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of the uh, the good players are really attracted to those neutral tones that they can work, or good painters, I should say, not players. Um, are really attracted to those neutral tones that can be played with in a lot of fun ways. So that that all checks out. It checks out. I just thought I'd ask about it. Oh, and well, it helps to bump off of whatever other color you want to use. So should so we? You, oh, sorry. Go ahead. If you want to use like a dark purple or uh, a light brown, all of those work with as a juxtaposition to the gray. Yeah. So should we expect you to be doing a uh, Red Scorpion army in a while? Mm-hmm. Me? No. Give it time. He'll change his mind. Yeah. Be it up war. I've, here we go. I've never, I've never been able to have more than two armies going at once. That's okay. We'll, we'll find a way for one of yours to disappear. <laughs> All right. And when in doubt, you just mercilessly bully him. As Bill mentioned, uh, we're, we've always been desperate to run a bad up war campaign. So we'll, uh, on, we'll that, get... on, on that note, uh, White Knight right now has a bunch of uh, Red Scorpion stuff in. Yeah, there you go. They got the the bad up rule book and everything. Yeah, is bad up is bad up forty k or is it thirty? Yes. It's forty k. It's forty. Yeah, yeah. Sure is. Alrighty, well, like I said, we do have a, a primary topic for tonight. Like I said, this is very free form. Um, I'll be kind of just giving you guys a lead in the sense that I'll give you an army that I think, uh, or not that I think, that I can statistically prove is hurting right now, uh, and give you guys the floor to talk about them for a little bit. We do have a few to work through, so at some point I might cut people off and say we got to move on and be depressed about somebody else's army, but you guys get the gist of it. Um, we can all be I, sad together. Yeah. It is actually kind of funny that we were on the topic of it because the army that is statistically hurting the absolute most right now in the entire game is our stunty little friends, the Votan. Um, my personal take on it is that I actually think that really for them, the primary thing is just their models just cost too much for what they do. 
Uh, at least that's been my experience in playing with them. But I'm I'm excited to hear from you guys. Um, so if you guys want to take the floor, like I said, try to not to run over each other, but and leave a little room for everyone to comment. But anybody so, have some thoughts? My only real thought on them is that maybe it's GW trying to over, like overcompensate for what they did initially. <laughs> that they were so busted when they first came out, and then they. They're like now. Now that they are in a new edition, they're trying to like over manage them. Man, I hope they do that to Eldar. <laughs> you shut your dirty fucking mouth. I would. Uh, I would echo what Cody said, but I'm not actually sure if that's the case because no, like I said, I, uh, I'm not sure if it is the. If it, it is. I just meant that's how I. What I feel. No, and I think I think it makes a lot of sense, big time. Um, the only reason I'm not 100 percent on it is just because I feel like they might have had the rules written before the codex came out oh okay but maybe they went back and then changed them i don't know but i do feel like votan right now is a knee-jerk reaction to to ninth for sure we we do know for sure that there were some last minute rules changes to the indexes um there definitely were some that have now become pretty widely memed uh for eldar and i know a few others also got some last minute changes so it's possible, um, but like Votan are, like they're really hurting right now. Um, it seems like the the issues with the army, uh, like some of them were definitely patched up a little bit because they did get that FAQ and and the errata that kind of helped a little bit. Got a so, few points dropped. So what what's actually hurting them right now? They're well, not, I think they're not doing well. They're what thirty four. 34, yeah, they're, they're low, low 30s win, per, win percentage. My take, like I said, I think it's just the case that they just can't put enough stuff on the table. I think too many of their models are overpriced. Uh, well, I, th I, think, uh, I think to echo that problem, like lowering the points would help. But I think it's the, uh, the grudge tokens because you need models to die to get the grudge tokens. Yeah. And, and you think so they I, just don't have... I don't think they're as, they're as effective as they need to be, especially with the whole army now hitting on, hitting on fours. Well, that's another one that's going to pop up, I know, a little later when we talk about another army that Arthur's really wanting to talk about. So um, I think the I think the army needs more access, more easy access to grudge tokens. It needs better, more access. So you say, better, say you better. get easier access to grudge token, does that fix just the model count for the mission perspective? For the mission perspective. Um... Well, like uh, a ten unit war, a ten man unit of warriors is one hundred and thirty five points. Right, and let's compare that to ten man units of sisters who were like a hundred, ten man units of Eldar who were like a hundred, ten man warriors, one twenty. Um, Very true, but all of those guys are T T four, are they not? Or T three? T three. They're mostly T three. Whereas, whereas warriors, I believe, are T five. Yeah, I think I think the main problem that he's getting at is not so much the, the unit cost in terms of that comparing them to sisters or whatnot, but comparing the fact that they need to die to do what they want to do, and it creates an issue of my my death t my death generation is too expensive for me to play the game properly. Yeah, if you could I, uh... if you could put on double the model count on the table, then grudge tokens would be <laughs> be amazing. But then you're putting on double the amount of models on the table. Um, yeah. If there was easier ways to say, like, I know, I know, you can spend a CP to get a grudge or something. Ryan was telling me some of the rules. There's, there's more than just a model needs to die, but I think they need access to, to more of it. Like, if, uh, if you score on this objective, maybe there, there's actually surprisingly few ways for them to generate outside of it. I, yeah. I know, yeah, like the calls got one, but compared to some army rules, like they actually don't have as much support for it. That kind of goes back to, like I said, though, like part of it is they don't have enough shit on the table, right? Is that, you know, if you only have six to eight squads or units or whatever, and then those units are <laughs> like they require a couple of them to die before you can realistically use your army rule. Like you can see how it very, they're very much quickly behind the eight ball. And like you mentioned, the four plus ballistic skill is it like people underestimate how huge of a nerf that is. Yeah. Maybe, so. maybe to fix them instead of having it that it's um that they need to die uh, maybe you could they could add as well as like if you take an objective from them or in their 
deployment zone or something like that, you get a grudge token. So have some more passive ways that they can like once per turn give somebody a grudge token. Yeah, yeah, I think like the the thing is the grudge tokens are strong. It's a strong mechanic, but it does need to be triggered, you know, a fair bit easier than it currently is. I at least in my experience. I've gotten to play them twice now this edition and it definitely would, felt uh, like they were really falling off. Would instead of actually like destroying a unit um, or just taking uh, some wounds from, you know, the mm-hmm. enemy unit instead, right? I mean, well, I know, kinda... I, I know it could be. I know it's easy for to wipe out a squad. Just a ten man squad can instantly wipe out a lot of times. But sometimes you got those hard units that you can't. That won't die, right? Like, and I'm talking on your own side. So yeah, if, if the opponent let let's say Bill's playing his Dark Elder and goes and strafes. And kill or kills a couple guys out of the unit. Is there a grudge happening there? Maybe they get a grudge token for just taking a wound instead of, um, you know, a wound per unit kind of thing instead of actually mm-hmm. a full unit dying, right? Well, well let's look here be... for a second. Let's say we give them all the grudge tokens that they could possibly use and nothing else changes. What happens to the army? They have unlimited grudge tokens. That's be terrifying. Well, like, <laughs> <laughs> is it? I, is that all of a sudden broken? Uh, I, I what do the grudge tokens do? Or if I played against them? But the, if the like, honestly? Is, sorry, I don't, I, mean, I don't mean to cut you off. If the discussion is about like um, how many grudge tokens they can reasonably generate to um, be viable in the current meta, how many is that? Would they be broken if they had unlimited? Here's the funny thing. I actually, I don't think they would. Um, I do think they would be very strong, though. But again, like this, so what grudge tokens do? Do what grudge tokens do? Because I heard someone ask there, um, is they they improve your hit and wound roll, um, depending on how many are are on an enemy unit. Um, but that's just it. Is whilst those buffs are very strong, as Isaac mentioned, um, Votan hit on a four up normally, so the plus one to hit is great, but it's hardly going to an auto hit. You know, and the plus one to wound is nice, but Voton weapons are actually, for the most part, very high in strength. Uh, they have quality guns, generally just at a low rate of fire. Um, and so the plus one to wound, again, is not quite as strong as you might see. Um, I think it could shake up their playstyle, but again, like this is an army that doesn't have a huge selection of units. Uh, it has a lot of units that are probably a little on the expensive side right now. So, like, great hypothetical, Arthur, but yeah, I don't think they would be busted if they were just literally plus one to hit and plus one to wound all the time. Which kind of tells you how far down the ladder they are right now. So then it's not really about grunt generation to fix the mechanic. or, or fix It would the, help though. Um, it would help, but that's not their core issue. They're just too expensive or... Too expensive, and I. the other thing is they do have a bit of that new army issue where they just don't have a, full a ton of or... units. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, th- I think, too, with, with GW's new mind frame in terms of how they want to change things, they're not going to go in and change any core mechanics in terms of Votan. They're going to try to fix, they're going to try to fix the points. army. They're going to try to fix the army by points. And then let the, let the new codex be the reshift to the army. Yeah. Are the Votan on the roadmap? I don't believe so. I don't think so. So they're a little, they're a little bit down the line, eh? Yeah, I think they're probably because they've only got till winter posted, and I don't think they're yeah, on that road map. next spring or whatever. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, and also too, just just one more thing with the codex. You know, they've said when it, anything comes out codex wise, they're going to get something either a new unit or a new model or a new something. And there's already been rumors that Votan are going to get a second release line, similar to how Sisters did and Necrons did, and all that kind of stuff. So, so Votan are going to get. More models. They desperately need it, so I hope so. Yeah. Them and them and world leaders need a need the second half of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of chaos, anyhow, another one which is <laughs> very <laughs> widely blind, and I know this will be a close one to at least uh, Andy here, since he's a, a recent convert con- convert. Um, Death Guard, who uh, take up a lot of a lot of ink when it comes to the complaint zone. Um, an army that's really, really been struggling a ton. 
uh, so far. And it's kind of sad because, of course, the bottles are amazing and they're very high selling and seems like everybody and their dog, especially in Edmonton, has a Death Guard army. Um, let's talk a little bit about them for a bit. <laughs> Can I ask you ask a question in terms of Death Guard first? Sure, absolutely. Do we think the issue with Death Guard is durability? Is that basically what it comes down to? Is it if they have better durability, that will? I don't think so. I think people complain that they aren't as durable as they'd like them to be, but I don't think that that's actually the reason that they struggle. Uh, before we open this up to anyone, I'd actually like to ask if there anyone here who has a Death Guard army and has played, I don't know, five to ten games of them, and like has the the personal experience to give their their opinion back on before we get into like other people who may or may not have an educated opinion, but it's always nice when you have someone who's played your army. Uh, my buddy Luke Ash is going to join us here. Uh, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. He said he wanted to take a strip out of Arthur. <laughs> no, I don't think yeah, we've got any... Don't, don't think we have a Death Guard no. guy here. So, uh, I have not played Death Guard this edition. Uh nor have I played with Death Guard. Um, they have been struggling for since they got their Codex and Knights uh, and throughout, and then uh, obviously in our current edition as well. And I wonder if the reason they're struggling is um, slow movement. Uh, the game of 40k is obviously a game where movement reigns supreme. Um, it gives you options, right? There's no consequence that Elder has been a top contender. Uh, right now, when they have some overpowered stuff. But even when they aren't overpowered, uh, savvy generals can kind of get where they need to be. And with the nature of the taco missions, getting where you need to be is maybe the most important thing when it comes to building an army. So it could just be that they get slow movement. That could thing. But that's a huge problem, to be honest with you. I, I think it's actually the core problem. It, it's just their inability. People say that, well, you know, they've got a lot of deep strike units that you know, can get them places. But like you mentioned, with 40k, it's not just about getting there once. You then have to get somewhere else. Yeah. And I think Death Guard really, really struggle with that. Although, correct me if I'm wrong, Death Guard is not supposed to be, like, in lore, is not supposed <laughs> to be super fast. It's kind of supposed to be like a grinding. Oh, they sure aren't, uh, lore-wise. Um, unfortunately, GW has struggled to make the game... Lord. In such a way that uh, you can have say, a, a slow grinding army and actually be successful with it from you know like a game standpoint. Uh, yeah. Unless you have a whole a whole wild of firepower to to back it up. Yeah. Yeah. Like it feels a big like scary. De Death Guard has some interesting firepower, but like not really enough to mitigate how slow they are, especially with mm -hmm. some of their big hitters like in melee. Which right now, uh, I'm definitely feeling that 10th is definitely more towards the shooting side. Some of their big scary melee against other uh, like marine-sized targets is just way too slow. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another, like that's a great uh, thought pattern there, Jordan, because I think that's another thing that's really cutting into Death Guard and, and quite a few other armies as well. If your army leans really heavily on melee to, to do its killing, which Death Guard kind of do, uh, you're going to struggle in 10th, because it's definitely a shooting men's game. Are, uh, are Death Guard's weapons rapid fire or assault? Like their basic bolters? Yeah, their basic weapons. Neither. They all I'm, just, I'm just wondering if adding if adding the assault keyword to their weapons help. would help, because then they could, at least, they could at least advance and do things. And like, uh, want to get you in that contagion range where they can start lowering your toughness mm -hmm. and doing silly things with that. Because I know well, giving the, uh, giving custodies assault was a huge, a huge plus because it gave me so much more movement. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of the, how I felt with them too. Um, the funny thing with Death Guard is we talk a little bit about them from a lore perspective. Is that yeah, they're they're supposed to be slow, but you know, the other end to that, of course, is that they were supposed to be slow and purposeful. Which, like, that's kind of something that I think that maybe 10th has done them a little dirty on, is that uh, historically in the game, whilst the army never moved super fast, it tended to get its full movement every turn. Um, and with the way the rules are currently constructed, maybe they, they aren't quite getting as many bonuses there, and they are susceptible to more malices. 
than they historically have been in the past. And that could help them out a little bit too. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. Is there any other problem? So like we've identified that they might just be too slow. Um, and they might be playing like a melee game and a shooting man's game. Is that is that the crux of it? Like yeah, is that for sure. any, okay. I, I so would then, also say that they, they really suffered from the, the lethality reduction in tenth. Mm-hmm. That like even the stuff that did hit hard previously that they did have when they do get into combat or when they do get shooting just isn't there anymore. So they you know, they they're kind of a wiffle bat, even though they are harder hitting in melee, they still just don't hit as hard in this edition now. And so now they're having trouble getting there, plus they're having trouble actually dealing the damage that they previously had done. Oh, and the game's only five turns long. So, yeah, yeah I almost see Custodes as a good building block template for them. Um, and they could really take some things from Custodes to really help them out. Yeah, it's funny. That's kind of the same archetype, right? Yeah. Well, uh, we won't we won't dwell on them too long because, as Arthur deftly points out, we're we're not experts on it. Um, but I just sure. want to get them in there because, like I said, I, I know that Death Guard are <laughs> much maligned on the internet. Although it is hilarious that everybody and their dog seems to play Death Guard in Edmonton, and we do not have a single person in chat that plays them. They're they're all in Nurgle Death Guard Church on Sunday nights, so you know it's understandable, but. You know, it is, uh, I did mention earlier, uh, it is Arthur's birthday, and I don't want to cock tease him for too long here tonight. Uh, I know that he's got uh, a double stocked uh, soapbox that he's ready to jump up on. <laughs> let's uh, let's have a quick chat. Is that, is that a about... <laughs> we should, <laughs> no. we should just skip right over your Adeptus Sorotus. Yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's have a little, let's have a little toxy woxy about our wonderful and beloved all female army. The Adeptus Sororitas, who are struggling along with struggling along with about a forty percent win rate right now. Uh, Arthur's a longtime player. Why don't you take us away on that, Arthur? Games Workshop just needs to watch the Barbie movie and engage in some feminism, and I'll just drop the mic there. You know. <laughs> uh, I've only played uh, three games with the sisters, um, and you know, uh, every time I play and I complain about it, all my friends are. Uh, they're not remiss to remind me that, well, of course it's going to feel like shit even playing Eldar. And every time I hear that, I hate it like a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> I'm allowed to not like playing Sisters after playing Eldar, just for the merits of playing Sisters alone. I lost to Admac twice in a row, folks, and they like they were close losses, but they were losses nonetheless. Uh, we don't have to talk to you about who the Admac player is, or the mission to give you any other details at all. We can just accept that Sisters are objectively the worst army in the game. <laughs> <laughs> from a scientific evidence backed background. How long did you play Elder? Now, I will contend that <laughs> sisters have always been garbage since their release. However, they have been propped up by the Bloody Rose supplements. So sisters pretty much have only been able to, be able to pick up stuff um, in melee, other than with Melty Meltas. But their other guns they're known for, bolters and flamers, they don't really get a lot of value on them. Um, some of the pricing is really screwed up. Uh, four retributors is priced at the multi melta cost, and I'm actually I'm a simp for having units where you can take any piece of war gear and pay the same. I really like that. I like that on like your battle sister squads because then you're not uh, punished for taking a multi melta or special weapons. Um, but on units like retributors, what if you want to take famers? And why are we locked to only five guys? That's when it feels really bad. Uh, they decided in their detachment to give them the Armored Lady supplement, which is, uh, and someone gave me shit for earlier for comparing sisters to Votan, because Votan need to die to have their thing go off. Sisters do too. Um, they need to be under strength to engage in your plus one to hit, or half under your wound to get that plus one to wound. And by the time you've lost half the models in your unit, who cares? Like, I'm not sure what the math is behind that, but... You have 50% reduced output now with the plus one to wound. Like, that's not good math. That's bad math. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, uh, we can, we can, no one else needs to contribute. I've got this on lockdown. <laughs> Here's how you solve <laughs> symptoms, okay? Uh, points reduction across the board. There's no reason that repension need to be the points they are, being T3 uh, in a world where they get overwatched and die. 
Um, there's no reason that retrovators need to cost like less than Space Marine fucking uh, boys. Uh, and their detachment fucking sucks. You know, maybe if they get a melee detachment. Uh, maybe they can start to get there, but they don't have the durability, I think, that you kind of need in order to, like, get out in the middle unless you have significant terrain. So, here's how you fix sisters. Uh, don't play them. Leave them on the shelf this edition, and then try again when we get a new edition of Warhammer. You were a big fan of the, the six-inch range reduction on multi melters, right? Yeah, like, I don't... You know, <laughs> it's kind of funny because throughout 10th edition, every time I played, like, Tau... Or, uh, you know, other units, some of the Eldar stuff. I was like, wow, 18 inches is a really cool range mechanism. Because 36 and, like, 48 is pretty much bored all the time. And 36 is mostly you're in range. You're only not in range if someone's in their back corner. Uh, 24, you know, you can usually get in range. And, but I really was an advocate for, like, the 18-inch ranges. Because that means that, like, there's uh, you can play around it. It's interactive. But on your melt and melty infantry, it feels like you struggle to get them into range. And then uh, as soon as you do get them in there, they get overwatched or they shoot. Now, the one time we did play, uh, Scott had a knight, uh, a big boy. And I had like, I had a triumph, the dialogus, some multi melters, miracle dice. I was able to down a knight in a single turn uh, with one unit of Bretts by making a million dice into miracle dices and Scott not rolling well on his saves. Uh, he, I think, let me do it. It's kind of like if you're in a D&D campaign and, uh, you know, uh, your wizard has just learned Fireball, so your your dungeon master groups up, like, eight enemies with, like, ten health at the same time, being like, yeah, do it. I want you to feel good about yourself. That's kind of what Scott let me do. You know, <laughs> wanted to make it so that I, I didn't fucking kill myself after playing Sisters one time. Did it feel good, though? Yeah, sure. Till that night. But, like, uh, Scott will tell you that, like, he didn't have to come. He could have perfectly mathed it out to be, like, impossible to shoot. So, like, that's interactive. That's good. I'm a proponent for interactivity. Um, I don't know if multi is needed to be that. And I think that if you take a look at, like, all the armies that are struggling, maybe not all, but most, uh, I wonder if there would be improvements if we change the melta keyword. I don't know if there are other armies, if Sisters are the only one, who, like, really rely on melts to get their anti-tank done. But uh, let's, let's, let's let Melta do something. Yeah, knights and like especially chaos knights really love their melters and i noticed yeah, playing cool. yeah i noticed playing them um the top melters are almost not usable anymore like the like the mm -hmm. uh, the smaller melted guns that we have instead of the demon breaths like yeah. it's it's very hit or miss even with like the limited rerolls that ck has so i don't know maybe Giving uh, Meltas like the anti vehicle four would be interesting. Oh, I see. It so. does. Because then it would kind of bring it back to where they kind of were before, where they're wounding a lot most vehicles on four. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although, if, if the other thing is, if they, if the army had access to a way to get devastating wounds in anti vehicle four, uh, that's mm -hmm. also terrifying. <laughs> but I do think yeah. um, Meltas across the board with um, uh, Anti-Vehicle 4 definitely would rein in like the very vehicle-heavy meta that we're noticing right now, especially with uh, Imperial Knights and uh, the Wardog spam uh, Chaos Knights. Well, and this is something that I remember talking to uh, Arthur a little bit about right when the edition dropped, was uh, for Sisters in particular, like... You know, they can run a lot of Meltas. Let's, there's no question there. But, like, what is it for an army when uh, they're going up against a vehicle heavy meta, melt, or meta, and they only have Meltas? Like, they don't have LAS cannons. They don't have other, you know, rail guns or anything. Like, they re sisters really don't have anything else. They are expected to use Meltas to crack tanks, and that's all they got. So, what's that like? And, uh, you know, the early returns have been pretty bad. Mm hmm. Yeah, I even notice like even the um, the eradicators into my uh, into one of my big nights. They, if it wasn't for Oaths a moment being as wild as it is, it mm -hmm. would not have gone as well for them as it did. Because yeah, they were doing everything on uh, t uh, threes and fives, 
mm-hmm. and just re-rolling. But because it was also eradicated, they also got to re-roll damage, which really saved them. Well, and the nature of Meltas is that you're not getting a ton of shots, right? So, yeah. 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 Does anyone else have some thoughts uh, <laughs> on Sisters before we move on there? I know our Arthur was very uh, eloquent uh, I, in his words. I, but... I think he was pretty thorough. Um... <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like just play uh, play Eldar more. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, he did mention uh, he did mention his Eldar, of course. Um, so let's pivot not to Eldar, of course, who are not struggling at all, uh, but to a, a version of Eldar that might be a little bit. And I know we have a house player here who can walk us through a little bit. And let's talk about uh, the prettier, sexier Eldar, the Drukhari. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I know that they're, they're not quite as bad off as some books, but they are still struggling a little bit in 10th, um, which is a little weird because they are actually like a fast, shooty army, which are two things that are usually good in 10th. But they are still having a little bit of a rough time uh, in the meta. So, uh, Bill, why don't you talk to us a little bit about them? Uh, the Jukari seem, they're very glass cannon, uh, especially coming from a power armor bar- background. It's a little bit of a tough one to wrap my head around. Uh, I find most of my games, I'm not outshot. It's just, I can't trade as well, um, taking the shots, uh, mm-hmm. durability obviously being really low, um, for the most part, like mobility got lots of that. I don't really have much in terms of a uh, combat solution with that army, but uh, shooting wise, I I don't really have many issues. It's just having enough of the right shooting in the right place, basically to do what you got to do. Jukari Haywire Blasters are really nice for the vehicles, but I am starting to lean towards more uh, multiple um, Dark Lances. Just for overall, pretty much range is being my big thing. I don't want to get overwatched, and I think being Wait, able to I've heard dance. it referred to as uh, I've heard it referred to as index dark lance. So yes, I, I have I have also read this, and a lot of people are saying you know on average running between twenty five to thirty uh, dark lances will net you enough enough shooting that you can do a lot of significant damage. Um, like I agree, dark lances are really good. You're basically firing last cannons at the whole army. Uh, it, it's just that durability, trying to come up with a better way to dance around the board. Having a, virtually a six plus and vulnerable save across the board is cool, nice. but not great. Mm-hmm. Um, although uh, very fresh into my Jukari journey, but uh, it's it's <laughs> it's been decent. Um, a bit of a learning curve for sure. Would you say something like a, a Fiona pain would help them out? Um, it could. My Rax and Talos Chronos, they seem to do quite well. Uh, overall, I, I don't think the I think the Talos is a little over cost for what he actually does. Um, I think to be honest, I think the uh, Cowboy Warriors are a little over costed too just for being so expensive at 120. Um, they can take a lot of shooting. I know they get a lot of the uh, options in their squad right now. I just, I don't know if... You know, it's funny. I, I, I look that. at I look at the wild success of uh, Crap World Eldar. And I look at how comparable so much of the Drukhari stuff is. And I know it's not straight across. There, there's definitely differences here and there. And it blows my mind that there would be as much as like a 30% difference in win rates between these two armies. And I wonder how much of it has to do with what you are talking about there, Bill, which is that you just don't trade that well. Um, And Dark Eldar and honestly, most T3 armies are naturally all about trading. That's, That's just the life of a T3 army. Once you step out of cover... You probably only get one shot or two because <laughs> you're going to get blown up. Um, and the success of Eldar seems to be very, like Craft World of Eldar seems to be very focused on the fact that they step out and they trade and then they disappear again. And I'm wondering how much, like, literally the difference between Drukhari and, and Craft World might literally just be 
uh, Craftwork Veldar have Phantasm and they have Fire and Fade. And that literally just, that alone just makes a massive difference. And I, I wonder if that alone wouldn't be enough to help. Which is kind of weird because that kind of sounds like Drukari, like from older editions. Like they used to dance around a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So it almost sounds like they've given Craft World more of a Drukari feel to them, which is weird. Yeah, well, I, I just wonder about it. And I also know, like, Bill, you, you, I know you're the guy to ask here, like, Scourges, right? Like, Scourges are where it's at. Scour yeah, Scourges are really good. They do have um, a native built-in rule, so they can move fire and then fire move and again. Fire fade, essentially, yeah. six inch. And then you still have the fire and fade for two CP um, yeah. with your regular strat just for Eldar stuff. Uh, it's very helpful. It definitely helps quite a bit. Um, I did have, I really like the pain token mechanics. I think they're great. Um, the only problem is, is when you don't get any pain tokens, if you've spent them all, it can make it, uh, a little harder. Actually, it, it's surprising. Kinda... Yeah. It's surprising how much you rely on those, uh, pain tokens that actually do quite a bit of work. Um, which was kind of, yeah, kind of a shock to me. Uh, but at the same you time, you feel pillow fisted after. Yeah, a little bit, you know. <laughs> the pain tokens yeah. kind of seem like a win harder mechanic. So, like once you start getting that momentum mm -hmm. going, you definitely have the pain tokens to start backing up with your empowers and everything. Yeah. But if you're not getting that and you're losing, it kind of feels like you're going to lose harder because you don't have that crutch yeah. to lean on to when you need to power up your your shooting. It, it does feel <laughs> very much like a crutch for sure. I think it, it sounds like the same old problem that that the Dark Elder have always had, where you know how the game's going to turn out in, like, the first turn. Like, the first two turns basically tell you how the entire game is going to play out for Dark Elder. The ball rolls one way or the other, and it, it yeah. just don't stop. Yeah. So, so Bill, do you find that... Because Drakari obviously have the, the mobility, which is really helpful for a lot of the secondaries. But do you find you don't... You need the durability when it comes to holding the midfield and the center of the table? Durability, or I have to throw more than I would like into center objectives to try and really take advantage of having like OC2, a majority of my squads. Um, it just seems, yeah, you really got to dogpile a bunch of units in to ensure you're going to hold it for a turn. Do you have any access or ability in terms of strats or pain tokens to give you an extra OC to a unit? Uh, not that I can recall. No, but That's they weird. do run. A... Sorry, go Sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> they do run a lot of troops um, naturally, like the yeah. Cabalites, who are OC two, which is you know more than most things you're going to come across. Yeah. Problem is that you know you could be OC ten uh, if your vehicle and all ten guys are dead. <laughs> it, it, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. Although I, I will say this, uh, as far as like battle shock mechanics and stuff go, I actually don't really have much of an issue with that army um, being a full like six plus leadership across the board. It's very nice to be able to rely on that. I haven't had a game where I've actually failed uh, battle shock. So don't don't get me started on battle shock. You're gonna get us. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna open some old wounds, man. No, I just I think, I think, I think the mechanic is a joke. Yeah, especially like, I'm really feeling uh, how bad battle shock is now with CK. Is CK's whole yeah. shtick is to go around it, and in four games of CK tenth, I've used the battle shock mechanics twice. All I can Rough. say is it feels good right now playing Tyranids with battle shock. I bet. Well, that's just it. It's, it's they put it in there for you to fail it, and nobody's yeah. really failing. It. Yeah, yeah. It it takes a, a fair bit of stacking of rules to make it work. So, yeah, it does. Um, because like it kind of segues again into the conversations we're already having here. Let's actually uh, go over there, kind of to Jordan a little bit, and talk a little bit about Chaos Knights. Chaos Knights actually aren't hurting quite as bad as some of the other factions we're, we're talking about here, but they, they are hurting. And, and the really interesting thing, of course, with them is that knights, like Imperial Knights, are quite good and vehicles are, are great. 
uh, in tenth edition. But but Chaos Knights are are struggling to put together the success that other vehicle based lists, not just knights, but even some of the Space Marine or, or Eldar vehicle based lists are having. Um, Jordan, I know you've played a ton of games. Uh, you're literally probably the Chaos Knight uh, authority, as far as I'm concerned. So why don't you uh, talk to us a little bit about them? Yeah, so the biggest problem with uh, Chaos Knights in 10th is what you want to work around with for your big knights is really only the Desecrator. With the Desecrator, you get your most important uh, war dog, your, um, your brigands, re-rolling their ones. So they're hitting on twos, re-rolling ones now, which should net almost all their shooting. And from there, like the other ones, maybe, the spoiler I tried out today, playing against uh, Grey Knights and Imperial... Sorry, not Grey Knights. Um, Space Marines and Imperial Knights. And like it was okay. Double uh, Rapid Fire Battle Cannon is hilarious, and the bane of Arthur's existence. <laughs> and, like, it's really good, Ew. but... You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but a problem with a lot of the shooting is see, uh, a lot of the knight and chaos knight guns lost six to oh. like 12 inches across the board and it's definitely showing on some of the things that uh you want to do uh with ck the biggest profile they want to use is brigands brigands are the entire army at this point you need to be running six brigands and with that you actually have some pretty scary firepower six Rank 12 Neltas isn't anything to joke about. And the uh, chain cannons definitely shred infantry. But after that, like the Moraxes are way too overpriced. They're 170 points for a single armager that carries a gun and either two guns or a gun and a melee. And the melee's kind of decent. But the free uh, heroic intervention stratagem isn't worth it when they're usually just a gun platform. Yeah. Uh, next is stalkers. You only ever take one. Any more stalkers than that, and you're being silly. You take one oh, yeah. stalker. Why? One stalker, so you can put Lords of Terror on it, so you can get get sticky objectives. That is the only use for the uh, stalker. The stalker is a character, which the other ones aren't. Correct. Which is what he what he's yeah. referenced. Yeah, stalker is the only character armager. Uh, that sounds, after that, sounds like a really boring way of playing the army. Not really. Um, like my favorite list right now is ten one. So ten armagers, one big knight, and it does a lot of work. I went against um, Dave. Uh, I can never say his last name, but he was he's pretty good with uh, Imperial Knights right now. And just mm -hmm. because of my armagers, with how much damage I put out, I took a knight almost to dead and picked up one of his armagers turn one with not with only about half my army shooting. And like I, it's I... it's scary. I actually, um, I can't remember who I had this conversation with. It actually might have been Isaac. Um, it was somebody at the club, though. But it, I was very uh, uh, intrigued by night players because it felt like at the start of 10th, there was this big sudden shift to guys wanting to play their big knights, partially because I think that they just didn't get to play them a ton in ninth because it was a very armager heavy uh, meta. And like over the last month or two, it slowly shifted back to everybody's just looking to how do I fit more armagers in or war dogs, whatever your army is. Yeah. So uh, the reason, the reason why was the, co the cost, the big knights were super undercosted, especially Imperial Knights Canis Rex. Like mm -hmm. I was undercosted to like a fault that if you weren't running him in every list, like you were shooting yourself in the foot just because mm -hmm. he can do free stratagems on himself. So it's free CP that you don't have to worry about. And he's just slamming out uh, things. But now like I, I've always run, 10-1, I, I tried a 7-2, seven so seven, 7 war dogs, uh, 2 bigs, and like, even with the, before the points nerf, like, it was pretty good, mm -hmm. but it's definitely not as strong as the armager spam, especially now with the Chaos Knights, where you need the 6 brigands, because hitting on 2s is just, it's just too good to pass up. Yeah, yeah. Would you say so? Like, here's here's kind of the question then. But like, I mean, it's most people I think can guess why maybe Chaos Knights are struggling compared to Imperial Knights. You know, the Imperial Knights just do have kind of less gated bonuses. Um, but do you feel like um, with Chaos Knights right now, 
that the issue that's kind of preventing them from jumping up into that kind of 50% win rate tier is more focused around your ability to kill stuff? Is it more focused around your ability to stay on the board or stay in the places on the board that you need to? Like, is it a speed or durability thing? Um, or is it kind of a mix of both? Like, like what do you what do you feel? So durability is definitely one thing that feels weird. Uh, knights in general are pretty decent with range because they always have that five up invul, so you have a thirty percent chance, whatever, to pass mm-hmm. things. And then melee, they usually melt just because mm-hmm. unless you're running the lancer, uh, you don't have an invul in melee. Mm-hmm. Like you definitely can uh, disappear from that, and like yeah. Uh, some of the shooting can feel a little weak sometimes. Um, most of the other data sheets in, like, in the book for especially Chaos Knights don't bring what the Brigand does, where it's the two up, and if you're shooting the closest person, one extra AP, which is huge, because um, that's in that one one model you're getting a thirty, like a net total of thirty percent increase. Yeah, uh, executioners like the auto cannons are not worth taking at all anymore. They're a lot of fun. I love them in ninth, but H, uh, four shots a piece, so eight shots in total. Strength, nine, AP, one, three damage. Right. Uh, most of the things you want to shoot, just it doesn't matter anymore. The, the Stalker, as I said, you only want to bring one for the um, sticky objective uh, enhancement. And then Huntsons are decent. And same with carnivores. Carnivores are more for like forward pressure board control. So it's <laughs> it takes a little bit of finesse to run like a, to run it. But with armagers, especially, you have twelve inches of movement that you can move cool. into that twenty four inch range and start slamming in those melta shots, which is really important. So, so you're saying that you think that offensively you're you're fine. It's more about your ability to be on the board where you need to be kind of thing. Yeah, because you're only a single, like, especially with rerolls and stuff, uh, there's a lot of things with either, like, you select one unit and, like, you'll be losing either your first big knight, like, turn one or two almost all the time, or you're losing two to three war dogs a turn, depending on how okay. many rerolls they have up. Yeah, okay. And the reason why uh, CK is doing worse than Imperial Knights is because of the detachment and army rules. Uh, yeah, for sure. Imperial Knights is just better and way more consistent. While the Chaos Knights do have some really funny ones, it requires Battle Shock. And yeah. if you're not getting those Battle Shocks off, you're not going to be able to do some of the really strong stratagems, like Dreadhounds. It's probably my favorite stratagem right now in the book, just for how good it is. What you do is you select one enemy model, and you can select uh, two and up, or it's three and up, of your armagers, mm-hmm. and they all shoot that, uh, they all have to shoot that one target that you selected. However, everything gets exploding sixes on that. Yeah. And if um, they're battle shock, though, it's exploding fives, which is super well, big. Yeah. Uh, and I super think that's situational. Yeah, ex- yeah. Ex- that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, even I, I use the um, Dreadhounds a lot just to, like, oh, there's a big vehicle. Well, welcome to the Melta Train. Here's six, uh, here's six shots. Hopefully I'll get probably two, except my yeah. dice hate me. But Well, I I know that any army that's leaning too heavily on uh, on Battleshock mechanics is, is hurting a little bit right now just because of... The fact that even even though it does happen, it is too unreliable uh, to really you know be basing your your army around, um, which is kind of actually a bigger topic. Which I think that we probably will have a little bit of a powwow a bit at some point uh, on a podcast. Um, but we're not going to dive too much into it now because we do have we do have some other armies we want to touch base on. Um, so thank you for running us through that, Jordan. Um, I actually I hate knights, but I'm fascinated by them. So <laughs> it's, a lot it's of, really nice they're to be a lot able to of talk fun. <laughs> especially now uh, that the drops are fi- uh, fixed for this edition like before yeah. like you'd have at max six drops and now you can have like up to 11 or if you're going really crazy 13 you don't I'm get more. um armies with a hyper at deploying yeah. all their chaff and then oh well here comes the like the shadow sword looking yeah. right at your big knights i think <laughs> it's interesting how how much there has been a disconnect between our like similar armies. It's like Dark Elder and Elder, they have a similar codex list. Knights and Chaos Knights are almost identical. 
but you have this massive win rate swing between them. I just I find that fascinating. It is. It is. And it goes to show just the, how much of a difference just a few rules can make, which is why conversations like this about some of these weaker armies are really cool. Um, well, maybe, is it also maybe something they could give the Chaos Knights is like an, um, like an upgrade or something that does make it so that like your battle shock is uh, like a three, you like you add three points to the battle shock. So like instead of like a, a, a leadership eight or battle shock eight, it is now like a twelve. Yeah, yeah. I know some chaos knights are running uh, skull cannons just to proc more chances. So Isaac, yeah, you had something to say there. One. Uh, well, I was just gonna say like I think it's kind of cut and dry that this edition, as of right now, is more of a shooting edition mm. um, between imperial and chaos knights. Imperial are the more sh shooting version of, of them, and, and Chaos is more the you know melee version. Although you know the shooting is not a thing to, to sneeze at, but I'm wondering if that's what's hurting Chaos Knights more is because you know they've got to get they want to get closer, they want to get into that combat. Um, yeah. not really. Um, the only dedicated we, one we have is the Carnivore and the Rampager, and Imperialites do have an equivalent to the Rampager with the Aaron. Mm, gallant, I think. Gallant, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's just the detachment site, like the detachment rules for Chaos Knights, are just uh, incredibly weaker compared to Imperial Knights. It like, will be nice when they come up with the rest of the Codex if they have a bunch more detachments that you can play around. Hopefully, because like the Imperial Knights um, feel no pain mechanic is way better than the. Um, Force battle shock for uh, chaos knights. Well, I, I think GW has more value. They think that battle shock is coming up way more often than it actually is. Hundred percent. Um, on like kind of on that melee swing though, uh, we're kind of gonna hit a hit a triple right now because there's three armies that actually all kind of I think need to be discussed together because they actually are very similar. Um, that I'd like to like to talk about a little bit, and that is the three, uh, let's say, choppiest versions of Marines that you can find out there. Um, because they're all kind of struggling, and as you guys can probably already guess, I think that the reason why is is pretty much the same for all three, and that is that Melee, just as a whole, is having a hard go right now um, in 40k. And these three armies specifically that I'm going to mention are, are Blood Angels, uh, space wolves and on the other side of the coin uh, world eaters and I know that they are different lists they obviously have their own ups and downs um, but all three are having a bit of a tough time compared to their shootier cousins uh, both on the chaos and imperial side uh, does anybody here play one or more of those armies uh, I don't but I did watch a game between Eldar and uh, Black Templars which is another super close combat spaceman army and I just saw the frustration in the guy's face the entire game. Because the Elder just stood back and shot shot him half his list before he could even get into combat. Yeah, I think, uh, like, I, I myself play Blood Angels. Um, and I know we have a few other uh, melee marine players at, at our current club. And uh, I've kind of had a chat to talk with them a little, or a chance to talk with them a little bit. And uh, yeah, we kind of all are in the same place where like, yeah, like again, some of those armies have a unit that's overcosted or some characters that aren't so good or whatever, but that's kind of a problem with most books. Um, it seems to be like the, the addition wide issues around effective close combat units that is really dragging these guys down. Um, and it really sucks because like some of them, like, I mean, if you're talking about say blood angels or even some like space wolf units, like they are fast. It's not like they can't get to combat, but nonetheless, they're, they're being forced to deal with issues that we didn't have in ninth. Like, uh, obviously the big one has been overwatch becoming prevalent in multiple phases. Uh, so it's harder to get around. Um, the changes to heroic intervention, you know, a lot of people thought heroic going up to six inches was going to make a big difference to really help out in melee armies, but then not very many people notice that you can't heroic unless it's as a response to a charge. So it's basically something you can't do to shooting armies anymore. Yeah. Um, 
and then of course like the you know like for some of the big meta monsters like eldar the ability to you know fire and fade or phantasm or whatever means that so often you know you're not actually even ever getting within charge range even when you think you should um that there's been a lot of a lot of nerfs to combat uh we all saw the lethality of the edition just in general drop um but there did seem to be more hits to uh combat units more or less across the board than there were to shooting units so they just don't seem to you know in ninth if you had a good combat unit you you basically detonated anything you hit that's just how combat worked it was harder to do it was harder to get your chance to hurt somebody but when you got a chance to hurt to somebody you tended to um now you know even if you do get there you don't you don't get the job done um and all of these things seem to kind of congeal together uh to create like this morass which is just it's obviously hurt the combat units in many armies but those three marine forces kind of lean on it so much um uh, and they just <laughs> they're not getting results right now world eaters actually are getting the worst results and i think that has to do with the fact that they don't even have they don't really have a gun line they can fall back onto you know yeah, it's kind of against their nature too well i think too you playing you know, this is a little side tangent, but you know, playing a playing a melee focused army, although mine is doing quite well right now. One of the things I have noticed though is you know, Scott, we used to get a lot more movement out of those armies with uh, with the charge piling consolidate that with that being changed right now, mm -hmm. we're losing a lot of a lot of good movement that we used to have in terms of grabbing an objective like charging just to grab an objective or yeah. or um getting that extra movement if you needed to just get a little bit further to get that secondary so it's so because of that loss and, and even to fly it, it's harder yeah. to get some of those secondaries the changes to fly are big for sure yeah, uh, and like, i think actually go ahead, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well i was just gonna say l luckily i think out of, the, out of those three that you mentioned uh those space marine factions I think uh, Blood Angels have the potential to come oh, out sure. on, on top of those just because they've got the jetpack unit. So Yeah, well, a flying unit that's also infantry, so it's not, exactly. not as hard done by. Yeah. 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 I uh, I think that a lot of it, too, like I, I kind of touched on this a bit, and actually I know like uh, Arthur and Bill here as Eldar players of one sort or another can probably comp comment a bit on it. Um, one of the cool things about 10th, and actually a thing that we all looked at uh, as a positive, was that it gave us more interactivity uh, on, on you know, our opponent's turn. Uh, and that's something that GW even came out and said they wanted, and something that we kind of all said we wanted too. Uh, I know in AOS, there's more interaction uh, when it's not your turn. But the interesting thing about that is it's kind of backfired, at least in the combat sense, in that there seems to be a lot of interactivity that happens when it's not your turn, which is specifically designed to kind of screw over combat armies, or melee armies, I should say, um, which maybe is holding them down a little bit more than maybe was intended. Uh, and that, I, like, I don't, like, it's hard because I don't know that that's an easy fix. Like, we want that interactivity, I think. But we also want, like, you know, it used to be with a with a melee army, you really, like, you got to your turn and you just tried to go all out, you know, and you just can't do that anymore. Yeah. So I don't know what the solution there is. Well, um, the only the only melee army that's really making it work right now is is uh, Custodies. And some people might argue that, well, Chaos Space Marines are melee army. They're not. They're a shooting army. They're they should be melee army. But they're better at shooting. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about custodies? Is it because they're durable? Is it because they have a melee stat line that didn't eat as much shit as everyone else? So, like, were the nerfs to melee too much? If all of a sudden we gave all the melee one of the two AP they lost, does that solve the problem? I think with custodes in specific, it like a, a thing to notice is that they actually they didn't get nerfed in melee at all. In fact, they got buffed. They're one of the few armies that actually hit harder in melee now. I would than second they used that. To. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of that's kind of the thing that sells them, at least it, during my time with them, was that they still have that ninth edition style, hey, when I get to you, you're gonna die. 
you know, and custodes, like they're not fast, but they are exceptionally durable. So they do get there. How exactly a melee army gets to melee is kind of something that's actually open. Blood angels like to go fast. World eaters like to go fast. Base holes lean more and custodes lean more towards, I'm going to be durable and I'll get there eventually. That's not a huge issue. It changes the play style, but not the outcome. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that custodes are doing well, but again, they are, they got a buff to their melee ability, not a nerf. I even am feeling like the melee nerf with, um, like knights, um, most of the time in, uh, in ninth, you'd be able to run one of your more melee centered, uh, armagers into like a, a blob of five space rings and probably walk out of it. Mm -hmm. And now, no. No? N yeah, not as much would, anymore. I You're not as confident? No, not at all. Like, I only ever use, uh, like, my dedicated, like, like my, my, my carnivores, which are supposed to be dedicated melee uh, war dogs for finishing. Like, they're only there to, uh, to finish squads and to put fr uh, front pressure on. Because if I don't have, like, even though they have six attacks on twos, it's not really good compared oh, to what they used to have. Yeah. Actually, th that's something I did notice today. Um, once again, being my first game of, of 10th, I've still mostly had my mindset at 9th. Um, that seeing a squad of, of assault terminators with thunder hammers and all that run into a psychophage and they couldn't kill it in one round of fighting was phenomenally wow. interesting to me. Yep. And then I just I fell back and I shot him. I shot him half to death with a bunch of barbagons. Yeah, yeah, just, just consistency of fire. And I assumed that when he, I wrote off the unit when he when he charged me, not knowing quite how that combat was going to go, and then saw the lack of damage. Yeah, yeah, it, that's kind of what I mean. Is that I think that it, a lot of it has to do with just the fact that even if you can make combat, which is harder than ever. It just yeah. doesn't hit like it used to, <laughs> you know. I went against um, Hudson's uh, bunker list. Like uh, mm -hmm. it had two hammerfall bunkers on it, and it chewed me up trying to get into range of my meltas. It yep. was like the, the uh, mass amounts of rerolls that Space Ring gets, like, even without Oath, the moment was absolute insanity. Yeah, I've heard those bunkers are scary. They're very scary. What makes them scary? So each uh, Hammerfall bunker, when it's not your turn, they get four instances of Overwatch. Oh my god. They're hitting, that they're hitting on thought, four. Uh, in this circumvents the Overwatch rule where you can only Overwatch once per turn? Yes. Yeah. They specifically say they can do it four times. Yep. So Hudson was running f uh, two bunkers put right into the front of his deployment. So me moving anywhere, especially if I had to move up the midfield to get to the center objectives, I was getting two um, exploding sixes, overwatching on fours with mm -hmm. twin linked uh, heavy bolter shots, which was doing more than his dedicated a uh, anti tank guns because of just how many shots I had that, to. Uh, that roll against. seems that seems like an oversight. Like that's like a little bit too much, you know. Well, I think it's, that they, they're they overcompensated with them because as soon as they're down, they can't move. Yeah, so they gave they gave them a lot of stuff. I think they also maybe thought. And this is fair that, well, it's just heavy bolters, which they are. Um, but it's also like, yeah, as as Jordan said, with enough shots and enough rerolls, uh, they start to do damage. You can also trade out those heavy bolters for flamers. <laughs> yeah, they can do that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but for, for the um, range bracket, you only want to do the, the heavy. It's just so good. Yeah. But like just to echo. Was, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. If, like, if I was not playing. Um, my uh, my knights. I was say playing like my harlequins that I'm starting to slowly paint up. I would be in a world of hurt unless I was able to. Like I'd probably have to take two turns making sure they were dead with uh, my, the fire prisons I'm going to be running before I advance because they would just shred my my army. So so to wrap this one or the uh, this particular section up, I, d I do really feel like the number one thing I would ask for, uh, not just for these Marines, but for a lot of combat or melee units across the board, would be to kind of get some of that explosive explosiveness in the damage back. Uh, you know, which is a hopefully something that can be addressed with codexes as they come out. 
um, because I know that there are lots of other books where there's maybe that aren't struggling or are doing fine or whatever, but that people will tell you our combat units suck now. Uh, I know Drukari are having that issue. Uh, I know that more generic Marines are having that issue. Chaos is having that issue. So that'd be a cool thing to kind of look at. Uh, There's some other things that could be fixed, obviously, but some of them are a little bit more complicated. Um, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum from this uh, melee focus we're on right now, let's go quick over and talk a little bit about Tau, uh, who a lot of people actually felt like um, would actually do okay early, like at early intent. There was a lot of chatter about like, were they good? Were they bad? A lot of people thought that they'd be complicated, but that eventually they'd get figured out and that there was like the, the book seemed good, like it would work out. Um, but so far that hasn't materialized. Uh, I know we have at least one Tau player here, but if you, if you've played them, either played against them or played with them a lot, feel free to chime in. Uh, but we'll let Arthur lead us off. I, uh, Tau is actually what I'm going to spend my next little while playing. Um, I think that like barring tournaments that like playing Eldar just probably isn't, uh, fun for, for people. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think Sisters is fun for me, so I'm, I'm going <laughs> to try to play Um, some people have, like, been casually getting some success with them. And, like, you know, there was that one tournament where, you know, the guy did really well, but it turns out he cheated. But, uh, they're not dog shit. Um, I think they have some, some, some good shooting, and I think they have a way that every Ballistic Skill 4 army needs to do, they have a way to circumvent that Ballistic Skill 4 with their, uh, like, guiding and observing. Uh, Maybe they just get a change to guiding? Or a clarification on it? What was the change? Uh, they, um, people want a clarification on it. Well, let, let, let's be realistic. You can't be like... The, that whole... Th oh, my God. <laughs> all the top players I'm sorry. There. Here's the thing. If you shoot, you cannot guide with that unit. He has shot... He is no longer eligible to shoot. That is the dumbest argument I've ever heard. Stop trying to do that. It's not a thing. You're well, I'll, I'll put it this way. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. I'm actually not opposed to being able to do it. But one thing that I do think needs to be clarified is that a unit can't be both an observer and a guided unit in the same phase. Because that's the, really the heart of it. Is that's, that's the problem. Is that people are trying to make it so that basically the entire army gets guided and the entire army is observing is functionally what they're trying to do. Feels I'm actually not against what the army's doing. What's that? That feels counterintuitive from like the the nature of, of that construction. Yeah. yeah. So one way or another, it needs to be errata just to make it clear that it's like no, a unit's either an observer or it's guided. It's never both. Stop dicking around. Yeah, it definitely needs that clarification for sure. Um. So. Last edition, I actually felt that Tau had maybe too much strength at shooting. Um, this edition, their guns did not get a glow up. It is still strength at shooting. And so things that are supposed to be their Swiss Army knives, their, their crisis battle suits, are still really good at killing Marines, but now are struggling to get over that vehicle hump. And, well, maybe that's not a bad thing because we have broadsides and rail guns to, to deal with that. Uh, it does create a situation where they're, you know, encountering the Melta problem. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. What if their their fusion guns just became you know anti vehicle um, or something like that? It's it's an option. I mean, I, I think the thing about them right now is that um, like historically, Tau have kind of gone where their suits go, and obviously, Crisis suits aren't in the best spot right now. Um, and so that's maybe just a big hole that's kind of missing in their the functionality of their list. Because as you mentioned, I don't think their dog should either. And they definitely do have some good units like uh, Breacher Fish and like some of their commanders. Uh, Ghost Keels. We won't get into too much of a conversation there. I know it's a I know it's a fraught discussion. Ghost Keels are. Um, but yeah, I I do think that um, having a bit more um, punch. I guess on the crisis suits would be good. I also wonder if they're a little expensive. Uh, and of course, I think that tower, one of those armies that are really, 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 really snake bit by the changes to fly and the changes to crisis suits becoming vehicles. 
and the way that that affects their mobility, because they used to be actually what I would think was one of the more mobile armies, and now I I would argue that they're actually one of the least mobile. I would uh, I would agree that uh, I think the suits definitely need a gun that's anti vehicle, anti monster, and a gun that's anti infantry. But make and it like each one is a different gun, so you have to choose your loadout. Yeah, one hundred percent different gun, one hundred percent. And um, why did burst cannons get nerfed? Who did burst cannons hurt? Um, basically no one. Well, and if, if I'm, I'll put my cards on the table, if I wasn't building a Votan army, I'd probably be building a Tau army right now. I really like, um, I really like what some of the things they have going on. I think if I know, you know, I won't name names, but I know there's, there's, uh, some people here that don't like the, um, loan operative keyword, but I think if Tau were to lose the loan operative keyword, they would be way, way worse than they are now. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I think, you know, um, hammerheads are just, they have the rail gun only being one shot is really detrimental to them. Um, I think pathfinders are interesting because they can observe for, uh, two units rather than just one. Like Scott said, the breachers are really, really interesting. Um, and maybe, maybe some of the guns just need more volume of shots. I don't know. Cause like, you know, using custodies going into something that's anything that or you know, a toughness 12 or 10 or 12 with a custodian spear that's strength seven, you know, you're, you're hitting on high and high number dice, but custodians have such a high volume when they're in melee that they're just, the sheer volume is, is killing things. Tau don't necessarily have that option with their weapons. So that's where I think yep. anti-vehicle would definitely help, you know, maybe just on the fusion blaster, probably not plasma. That might be too strong. Um, and maybe one situation it'll change they could do is make the battle suits uh, a blister skull three up. Like, because I know that the, the army used to be a three uh, three up army, everything became four up. Make make the crisis suits because it's supposed to be you know the elite, the elite of the elite fire warriors that took on the role of battle suits. So make their battle suits T three. If everything else is four up, you do make a distinction between quality of fire. I'm not. I'm not a potent. I was a Tau player. I definitely wanted that. I don't know if that'll make them too strong or not. I think one of the issues they're also having right now too with the suits that kind of echoes what Jordan was saying is they decreased a lot of the ranges on those yeah. guns. Yeah. Is that kind of your your feel too, Arthur? Like, do you think that like the the heart of the Tau issue goes back to crisis suits or, or suits in general? Like, if we were to buff suits, if we were to make suits. Let's just say generically good somehow. Um, would that kind of solve Eldar or uh, Tau's problems? Uh, like if they stop becoming vehicles, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, that's what that they're actively being punished for. Um, let them walk through walls, uh, and like I actually, I think Walker should be able to walk through walls. That's a whole different discussion. Uh, if they change the fly word, like that's another thing that's holding them back. Mm -hmm. So. And I, I, I don't even know if crisis suits themselves are bad, but they might have just had like the the problem of like when Games Workshop identifies a certain unit type that is too good this edition. Like uh, in seventh, bikers were too good, so in eighth they made bikers garbage, and then nobody played them, and they're still bad and being punished for it. Um, maybe that you know they just had the bad luck of being hit with the nerf stick, or maybe they should have been vehicles all along, and you know I don't know. Uh, but I don't know if it's just like a, a data sheet thing, um, or if it's data sheet plus being a vehicle plus doing this and doing that. Like if someone's playing crisis suits, unfortunately, they're they're gonna lose to bring it down. If you have enough suits, people are just gonna be like, okay, we'll bring it down and uh, with secondary. GG. I don't. Know. I just feel like the the cool thing that draws people to the army shouldn't be the thing that you punish. I mean, that's how that's how knights are. Every time you play, it's like, hmm. Can I take another secondary and make it work with bring it down? Yeah. I, it's funny because, of course, the the, the running kind of feeling in 10th is that vehicles are great, that this is a good time to be a, a vehicle, but the, the crisis suit really shows you where <laughs> where the vehicle keyword can actually hurt you. Um, not just the crisis suit, obviously, lots of suits. Um, well, and, I guess and that, I, sorry, Arthur, or uh, Isaac, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that I think GW's logic behind all of this is they don't want suit. They don't want crisis suit spam. 
Yeah. They want they want you to you know fill out the army with with different types of troops, vehicles, in terms of tanks and and all the other stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so because of that, you know, they make suits not as good. They up their price on them because they want you to be running you know uh, uh, strike teams and breachers and uh, tanks and uh, piranhas and all that type of stuff. They want a more fully fleshed out army so that, you know, they'll go after the units that they see people just spamming and, and do things to, to make them not as uh, high up on somebody's radar. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. Unfortunately, the ice crisis suits are like the most iconic thing out of the town. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's also interesting because um, historically, GW's way of kind of making, like outside of outright, putting like an O to one tag on a, on a unit to prevent you from taking multiples. Their best way to kind of make it so that you might play a unit, but not spam it was to actually just have a really stupid combo in a book where you could really only make that combo happen once. Cause it was attached to like a relic or a specific character or something. Yeah. Um, it would make the unit really good, but of course you could only do it once. And then that was a good way for people to kind of get their rocks off on that, that, central unit but not play the crap out of the maximum number of them that they could um crisis suits of course have tons of characters that can join them um and most people seem to agree that the commanders are in general still pretty good uh i think it has a lot to do just with the flexibility of stuff you can do with them um but clearly they don't feel like the commanders put the crisis suits over the top in fact they usually seem to think that they they just add too much cost to the unit that's already very expensive um so that's kind of an interesting dichotomy there, uh, where one thing that you would think would actually be benefiting crisis suits is, is hurting them. And it kind of goes back to the question that I kind of asked at the start, which is maybe they're just a bit too expensive. Um, but I don't know, obviously. So well, it, 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 they're actually a unit that uh, you have to be very careful with your points cost, because if they're too cheap, it's game warping. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, I mean, last edition, the able to shoot in combat thing and all that, I don't know if they can still do that now, was frustrating when you had these giant blobs of crisis suits. Oh, they, they definitely can now. Yeah. Yeah. They're vehicles now. But that also, of course, means the, the flip side to that is now they can actually be shot at while they're in combat, too, which fucking sucks. So, uh, Andy, you, you had something to say there? I was, I was just going to say with, with the armies in general, you guys are finding that maybe a, a lot of these armies that are even just in the whole of 40k are the armies or the units you feel like you're getting pigeon toed into taking certain units or a certain play for the armies? I know CK is. I mean, yes, but like that's been a thing that Games Workshop has done for a long time. And like it's usually the things they want you to buy, right? All of a sudden, what's good? The new shit. What's bad? The stuff that was good. Right. That's not a surprise. That's Games Workshop sales. And are you, are you finding that in with your armies right now? I mean, if you look at Eldar, what, what's good? Fucking Warwalkers. Who was playing Warwalkers? Support by you? Some people were playing them. I think uh, you were playing Warwalkers, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Warwalkers against me. Uh, they were bad. Uh, Before Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although I do find it funny that we're complaining, we're talking about the the uh, the shooting army of like 40k having a win rate problem when shooting armies seem to be like doing amazing right now. Well, yeah, and that's, and that's why I, I find it very funny, or not funny, but very interesting that Tau have struggled a bit, especially in light of the fact that again, a lot of people seem to feel like, and Arthur kind of t- said it too, like there's something there, but. Just nobody's quite been able to put their finger on it. It reminds me a lot of Death Watch in Ninth Edition, where everybody kind of agreed that's like, oh, you know, I feel like there's there's a there's some here. There's a way to make it work, and just nobody ever quite made it work, which makes me think that it's probably not there. But maybe they're really close. Maybe it is really close to being something that could actually work out real well and be a strong book and really rewarding to play. Um, nope, no one's found the secret sauce yet. With just a few tweaks. Um, but maybe Arthur bits the nail on the head. What we really need is a new crisis suit uh, uh, model or, or kit to release, and then their rules will be bonkers and solve them problem. Am I right? Oh man, if they use that uh, the far sight, the far sight leg and ankle and feet as yeah. the 
like just hit that whole new Farsight model is just amazing. But I think too, one of the things that really stand out for me in the whole army is the strike team. Mm-hmm. Their range got significantly reduced. Well, a lot of their, like a lot of their guns got reduced range. So. And tower always known for range. Mm-hmm. And so I think people are having a hard time really figuring out, you know, obviously Richard Siegler, you know, is pushing, pushing the envelope for what should be used for town. It seems like everyone's following suit with that. But I feel like there's there's something else. There's some other combination for that army. What did he do that uh, was? So he's using Tetris from Forge World. But that's uh, why everyone knew those were good. Sorry? Like, that's not secret tech. Everyone knows Tetris are good. No, no, but he's he's the one that's been pushing the Tau list. Like, he's the one who's getting everybody. It seems to me, I, mean, I could be wrong, but it seems like he's he's he was one of the first people to use Tetris this edition, and people kind of jumped onto that. He's 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 wholeheartedly one hundred percent behind one hundred percent behind um, I, I, those deals. I think if you need to use Forge World to make an army good, there is a core problem with the army because Forge World is supposed to be that cool thing you spend two hundred bucks on. You know, it's your centerpiece model. Not like this is how I, I make this army viable. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Tetras are a smaller model, but yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Um, and obviously, we know historically that anytime a codex has to lean on Forge World to be successful, that's a really risky uh, and not ideal situation because Forge World's so hit and miss with rules. <laughs> uh, we do have uh, two more armies that I want to cover just before we wrap up tonight. So we're going to move along. I do think that. Tau are definitely one of those ones to really watch in the coming, you know, month and a half or so as we get these erratas and data sheets, because they could they could turn around really quick. Um, but one other one which I actually think we should watch out for, and which has actually coincidentally made some waves this last like week and a half or two weeks, um, but is still technically a struggling army, uh, is Grey Knights, um, who are another army that got a lot of kind of press at the start of the edition not necessarily for being good or bad but just for being so much different than they had been before uh their new rules leaned incredibly heavily on like ultra ultra movement they very quickly became one of the most uh mobile armies in the game if not the most mobile army in the game and of course they got that that big glow up on the defensive side of things too um but in my experience uh playing against them they've really struggled um mostly just through a lack of offense this is an army that kind of uh, like sisters we talked a little bit about just like they have to lean on weapons that don't do enough damage and and one thing i really noticed uh with gray knights is they seem to be almost completely devoid of rerolls which is weird um because pretty much every army's got somewhere that they can count on getting at least some and gray knights just do not have rerolls and then you lean on the fact that all their combat and a lot of their guns are, you know, in that strength five, six, seven band with, you know, zero to one or two AP and one or two damage. And they just, they really have a hard time making damage stick. They've had some success uh, due to their ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous mobility um, and some tricksiness, which is always fun. Um, but they are struggling a little bit right now. Uh, obviously, my opinion is is that it's on the the damage side of things, but if you guys have some insights into them, please do share them. Uh, I do know I have a friend uh, who has been playing Grey Knights basically since 7th, mm -hmm. and he says that it doesn't even feel like the same army anymore. Yeah. Um, that the Super Mobile, which is, again, we were talking about how all of these mobile armies are doing so well, and it's not, mm -hmm. which is, I think, is interesting. So, yeah, I, I feel like them getting rid of all the Demon Hammers... And getting rid of the bite of close combat is what's hammering them. Because if you if you gave them that similar, maybe not as good as, but similar fighting to Custodes, where they have the two up, the three up AP, um, a, a bunch of damage, they would rock. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it, it feels like an army that GW has kind of quietly been ignoring the last few years, because they, they've had no Primaris models. They've had no new real models for them in the last, what, six years? I might be wrong yeah. about that. It's been like a character or two, and that's it. Yeah. They had a character every codex, right? They had uh, 
their their grandmaster librarian come out and then they had their primaris one character come out which was a really fucking cool model so they've shown they can make primaris grenades yeah but like they haven't made any of the primaris uh specialty marines right are there primaris dark angels out uh yeah, there's primaris uh there's primaris are there primaris uh like any of that black templars yeah yeah, yeah. No, it's just something I've noticed that they 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 seem to they've they fix one problem by giving them like some hypo mobile, and then they've taken away the other half of what the army needs for success. I know uh, oh, Hudson yeah. uh, put up a uh, like a big why the army's bad right now because he's been playing a whole bunch of the uh, grenades and just getting just slapped. He's trying so hard, but <laughs> oh my god, is he getting just munched? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take over Arthur's role here, and I'm gonna throw out a hot take. <laughs> are uh, are the Grey Knights uh, durable Drukari? They're kind of playing like that. Yeah, like they trade the offense for the defense, I guess. Yeah, a little bit. Oh, and I think the other thing that's hurting them is everything has anti psychic now. Like everybody yeah. in the dog has something that has anti psychic, and every single unit of the of the um that the Great Knights have is Psychic, and they have certain abilities that normal Space Marines have without the Psychic keyword that they have with it, so it actually makes them weaker. Yeah. Yeah, From and I know point. that's been a, that's been a, bit, that's been a big issue uh, for a few armies, them and obviously Thousand Suns bring this up quite a bit, So, but Thousand Suns have had a little bit more success, so... Um, oh yeah, because Cabal Dice are brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh -huh. Isaac, you actually make a great point because it it does feel a little bit like it's it's the same symptom where it's like this army is so incredibly mobile and that is outrageously important, especially with uh, as Arthur calls them, uh, if you're playing the taco missions with the tactical objectives, that that mobility can be so strong. Um, but you do still need to be able to get things done on the board, and for Dark Elder, it's sometimes an issue if they just don't stick around long enough. Um, Grey Knights do, but they just don't they don't force their opponent off the table. Uh, so there's always counterplay. I'm almost wondering if it's better for the for the Grey Knights just to lean towards troops. Don't take don't take the Master Blaster. Just go hardcore troops and just try to try to survive that's what, as long uh, as possible. That's what Hudson's players. mostly doing. Yeah. And he's it's still there's not enough like if I remember correctly, I'm still trying to find uh, his message in, in the chat. But if I remember correctly, it's the big thing is, yeah, their mobility, but their biggest detriment is their cost, and they're actually not as tanky as uh, like there's some, like they should be. Yeah. Um, they get, especially their troops, like coming in out of, especially Overwatch, can just get shredded by certain things if you're not paying attention. And they're, they're big. Um, yeah, their, their big um, AT is almost all gone. Mm -hmm. I think they only have one eight like solid AT, and it's melee. I think it's well, just like maybe, I think it's just the dead game hammers on the Grey Knights. Yeah, yeah, and last cannons. But like, mm -hmm. I don't think he, he's been running those. Um, but yeah, no. For the things you want to take troop slots, they're way too expensive because they're definitely overcosted. And like the Perdigation squads got hit so hard, uh, which they probably hit got hit harder than they should have been uh, for what I, they were I, able to do. So is this, a, is this a Sorry, faction go. where points could, yeah, really literally be the solve? I, I think he, uh, as as Jordan said, that's another thing to keep in mind with Grey Knights. I do agree that most of their units are. Overcosted for sure. I think that they could definitely do with a drop down on on that side. The nice thing is, I do think that that's almost a guaranteed uh, thing come the fall or whenever their first points update is, um, and it's awesome because it'll probably, as Isaac's kind of saying here, help them a lot. I still feel like the army, like it needs more punch one way or another. And we did talk a little bit about how melee is struggling right now. And yeah, Grey Knights are an army that historically have done their most damage in melee, so maybe that's kind of a thing to watch out for them. I would, um, I would like to see the return of like th uh, the Demon Hammers and all that. Make them, make them you know, bite. Mm -hmm. 
The interesting thing I find now, uh, and this is kind of why they popped up a little bit this last week or so, um, specifically, most famously at the team championship, because uh, they were they were on a few of the stronger teams. The interesting thing about Grey Knights is their, their durability and their speed makes it so that they're, in general, um, they do maybe lose too many games, but they actually tend to keep games closer than a lot of the other kind of weak factions. Because they do score okay. Um, they just don't score enough to win. <laughs> so, yeah, like, honestly, maybe just a few little tweaks, like points costs or a tweak to one or two rules could could go a long way towards flipping that, you know, I think they're somewhere around, like, a mid-30s, high-30s kind of win rate right now and pushing that up very dramatically. Because they do tend to lose uh, closer games, not getting blown out, you know? Oh. Um. Maybe makes our psychic abilities really bite. Yeah, that's another thing too. Uh, you know, if we're gonna pay. I know Hudson's been getting blown out quite a few times. Like he's been having, I think he's done six games, and mm -hmm. maybe half of them have been like close as as he starts experimenting with lists. Well, and I I'm hoping that that turns around for him because Hudson's like the nicest guy on the planet. I'm just speaking from like the stats that I'm finding online. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but we can also, honestly, it really doesn't matter what Hudson's playing. I, I really just hope that he has the best possible experiences because anybody who's ever met Hudson just knows that he's the type of guy who deserves the world. <laughs> he had such um, a bad day today. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. he's just, he, <laughs> yeah. He, he also gets like some of the worst games too. I feel so awful for him. Oh, no. I, beat, I, I beat him 88 to 44 and then his bike got stolen. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> you well, stole his bike after? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I stole. No, I purposely went and stole. No, um, yeah, he went outside and uh, he locked his bike up behind Red Claw, and uh, they uh, they took the bike. Oh my god! They even That's tried to take the other guy's bike, but it was uh, in front of the store on the um, one of the handicap posts, and they actually took the whole post out of the concrete trying to get Jesus the bike. Christ. So they took the bike but left the Green Knight army. <laughs> well, they knew they aren't good right now, so... I mean, yeah, uh, they took the thing of value. There is just one more army that I think we should touch on before we wrap up for tonight. Um, I don't know offhand if any of you guys play them, but I, I've had a chance to play a game or two against them, and this is another faction that was actually thought to be probably pretty good going into 10th, but hasn't had the numbers show up, and that is Imperial Guard. Um, again, this is a gunline army. Uh, and they actually, their index it has a lot of spicy stuff in it. Um, the return of, you know, infantry blobs, Leonatus, or whatever, however you pronounce his name, being so good, uh, indirect getting a bunch of buffs in this edition, the fact that guns were just back with a vengeance. Um, and yet, here we are, you know, two months in, and Imperial Guard have like a barely 40 something percent win rate. Um, What's the problem? Like, are they just too static? Is that it? Is it the nature of this army that it can't necessarily get around so fast? Because in my experience, it's actually an army that tends to play fixed objectives and just goes for, for like homers and engage and scores lots there. So I feel like that's not the issue, but maybe it is. Um, but one way or another, they're struggling to win. I'm actually surprised they're not doing well, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. They've, got, they've got the vehicles, they've got the tanks that can hit hard. Um, they can bring... Is it one unit back a turn or phase? Yeah. That, that's yeah. only for their uh, infantry. Infantry, yeah. But still, that's you could bring a unit back and maybe get it on an objective or steal something for secondary, what have you. Um, yeah. It just seems like like I agree with what you're saying, Scott. Like it seems like they've got a lot of good tools, so I don't understand why they're not actually doing well. I'm I'm actually really surprised by that because looking at like the Krieg list, you take a lot of indirect blast fire. And the Krieg themselves, you know, they have the, you lose one guy, they get plus one to hit, and then you lose half the squad, they get plus one to wound. Like, I'm surprised they're, they're doing bad when you have so much, like, offensive ability. Yeah. Yeah, like, when I went against um, Imperial Guards in the league, um, I pretty much kept him in his deployment zone, and he couldn't move. I, I that, think the only thing that moved in his entire army outside of his deployment zone was three Lehman. No, only two of his Lehmans got out, and they were swiftly just kicked 
right into right back into his deployment zone and off off the field. And so I was the getting tanks... Overwatch by like his shadow sword on my big knights. Did the tanks just not have enough firepower to to take down the knights? Yeah, as soon as I rounded the corner, I like if I played it a little bit more aggressively and put more like and smarter with more brigands, I definitely could have picked up almost all of his Lehman's turn turn one or two. That's surprising, but it's interesting. Not. It's really interesting. Think, is it is it control board for them? Yeah, they they don't have the control to stop like, especially with with knights. They don't have the control to stop knights from moving up, and knights with their meltas. They just walk up, and I think the Lehmans are on T10? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so you're, yeah. either way, you're wounding them on threes with your Meltas. And yeah. especially with if you're running the six Brigand list, you have uh, a whole bunch of Meltas that just walk up and tear apart his their list. Like, I was running four or five Brigands and two Huntsmen, and I, in one turn, I half health his shadow sword with two brigands. Yeah. Well, although to be, to be fair to them in that situation, playing knights is very different from playing different armies. Yeah, I don't like. I, I do see that that maybe that's a potentially bad matchup. But I guess it kind of depends on the exact imperial guard army, though. Um, but I'm wondering, just for the wider game, you know, where has their struggle been? Um, yeah, because I, I would assume with their sheer numbers, they they would have good board control. Yeah, um, it's a tough one because like, a, and I'd love to have an Imperial Guard player here to talk to us a little bit about it. In my experience, uh, when I've played them, I only have played them with custodes. It was a little bit of the same where like I found I was able to kind of lock them in, and whilst their their consistent damage was very high, they didn't have that like. I'm going to blow up this turn and really just take out half your army ability that some some of the other shooty armies in the game have right now. Um, so I was able to kind of board control a little bit, but the thing that I said is that, you know, depending on who, how you construct the army, they can get in behind you too. So, like, actual complete board control was actually very difficult for, versus them. Yeah, uh, or I, the ones I played. He uh, he actually did the stratagem to bring back his uh, some of his infantry to try and scoot around into my back objectives, but into knights it didn't matter. Like just my yeah. stubbers alone took him out. Yeah. Took his took his guys out. Doesn't yeah. that strat also work on scouts? Uh, it works on sentinels. Yeah. Sentinel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. had no sentinels. Um, but they can also run like Tempestus Scions for deep strike and stuff. Too. That's again like this is the weird thing. Like the, it's a huge army list. They have tools. And they have guns, I and they have because of Overwatch. And well, Overwatch could definitely be part of it. But here's the thing about it: they're also one of the meanest armies in the game at dishing Overwatch. Mm -hmm. So, like, <laughs> isn't some of it, it, like with their support weapons? Can they, if they're next to a commanding officer, Overwatch on fours? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. So, which is still not as good as the Hammerfall bunker, I think, because and, Hammerfall and bunker. This is, is partially why I kept them. <laughs> This is partially why I kept them for last, because I actually think they're one of the most puzzling, uh, I guess, kind of failures of 10th edition right now. Um, and they're one that I would encourage a lot of people to kind of look into and just kind of, you know, reach out and talk to your Imperial Guard friends. Um, because I don't have an answer right now for why they're struggling. Um, but clearly they are. I, think I just double-checked. They're at about a 42% win rate, which, uh, you know, is bad enough that it's there's something wrong. That is, I think, a puzzler, because everything seems to be there for them. Sure, they're not the fastest army, but they can dish out a massive amount of firepower. Is there a ballistic skill for shooting army that's doing well right now? Ooh, good Nids. question. Good question. Nids are ballistic skill more. I was going to say, Nids are the closest you can get, but Nids, they're doing it through oh, kind of a, <laughs> a combined arms, and then, yeah, Spore Mines being so janky, right? Yes, I, I do think that that's a big part of it. But the thing is that Imperial Guard are also like the least ballistic skill four of the ballistic skill four armies because mm -hmm. they have such a wicked access to rerolls. They have orders which actually boost their ballistic skill, not their hit roll, so they can double stack uh, that bonus. And uh, of course, their rate of fire is second to none. So you so would like, say if you they are, you would say if you're secretly playing them right, if you're playing them right, they're secretly really a ballistic skill three army. Well, they're. Probably a ballistic skill three and a half army. Let's put it that way. <coughs> yeah, because they don't have yeah, the strength. To... That is an excellent, uh, excellent observation, Arthur. I 
really hadn't even i mean i bitched about a few ballistic skill four armies but uh it is a thought that it's something to think about um anyhow it is something to think about uh please do think a little bit more about it we're gonna shunt over to bill here to kind of take us out uh because we do have to wrap up our podcast they can't they can't go all night even if We'd love them to. We do have one thing which uh, we're not going to talk about tonight, but which would, which we do want you guys to tune into our next podcast for because it's a big deal and it will be something that does go all night. Uh, so do tune in next week for some info on that. Uh, but Bill will take us out for the evening. And I uh, do want to say thanks to you guys for coming out and hobby casting with us tonight. This is a new thing. We're not going to do this all the time, but we did want to try it out a little bit. Um, People get bored of seeing our four incredibly beautiful faces on camera all the time. We do have to throw a few uggos in once in a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so thanks for that and uh, for chatting with us. Thanks for having us, guys. I'm trying to be pretty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah, just uh, big thanks to all the listeners if you made it through. Uh, with our almost uh, two-hour hobby session jam here we got going on. Uh, hopefully you were able to tinker away on some of the projects that you have lingering in your workshop. You are able to get some stuff uh, progressed. Uh, big shout out to the patrons. We got Frederick, Dustin, Tyler, and Chris. Uh, we really appreciate the support, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. If you are interested in becoming a patron, uh, please check out the links in the description. And as we have uh, new um, tiers and other perks kind of coming out um, for our program in the next little while, uh, hopefully that might entice some more of you to support the channel. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. And, yeah, we'll definitely touch base with you all next time. Peace. Did you plug the Patreon? We need to plug the Patreon.